In this spiritual world, we are often warned to watch out for individuals who misuse their powers. But what if that individual is your wife, who used her spiritual gifts to confuse judges, witnesses, the jury, investigators, police officers to get away with murder? And you're about to be her next victim. This is the story of the voodoo wife killer, Josephine Gray. Born in 1946, there's not much information about the early life of Josephine Gray. We know that she did have a rough childhood and she was very active in the church. But we do know that Miss Gray was a very flashy individual. She loved flashy cars, flashy clothes. However, she was a custodian at Montgomery County Public Schools. So many people did wonder, where did she get all this money from? In 1967, Miss Gray married her first husband by the name of Norman, where they had five beautiful children. However, their marriage was not as beautiful as their children. It is told that they had a absolutely horrible marriage, so much so that Miss Gray actually took up a part-time job cleaning offices. And this is where she met William Gray. William Gray goes by Robert, so we're going to refer to him as Robert throughout the story, but he was married as well with six children, and even though Josephine Gray and Robert were both married, that did not stop them from starting an affair. So, of course, Robert's wife named Frances was not happy about this. She just couldn't believe the family-friendly man that she married actually betrayed his own family and started an affair. His demeanor started to change. His attitude towards everyone started to change. He went from happy-go-lucky to to very impatient and snappy. So with Robert's demeanor being oddly different, Frances took it upon herself to do a little bit of digging, some investigative work. She wanted to know why did his demeanor all of a sudden change like someone's in control of him. So after doing some work, she figured out that it has to be someone putting something in his food for him to act like this. There's no other way for this to make sense besides him being under a spell. So Frances advised her husband like, hey, I already know what you're doing. I just stop eating her food and let's see what goes from there. And once he began to wean off Josephine Gray's food, it's like the family man was back. Like nothing ever happened. He just picked up where he left off. But once he started back eating Josephine's Gray food, that puppet type of attitude came back. So diving a little bit into Josephine Gray, we could kind of start putting the pieces together. Going into her bedroom, you will see nothing but herbs, powders, dolls, different oil concoctions. With this type of evidence laying around, Norman knew that his wife was having an affair, but he seen what his wife is capable of doing, so he genuinely feared for his life with addressing the issue. And he had tangible evidence as to why he was scared. He saw voodoo dolls that looked like him, spells with his name in it, candles lit, so he knew if he were to ever upset Josephine Gray, it could be fatal. And he was right. One night, Norman woke up from his sleep to see his wife pointing a gun at his head. Josephine Gray fired the gun, but it misfired. So his life was spared, but not for long. March 4th, 1974, Norman was found in his car on a back road in Gatorsburg, Maryland. I hope I said that right with a gunshot wound to the right side of his head. And of course, the investigation began. During the investigation to figure out what happened to Norman, two witnesses approached an officer and said that they were offered $5,000 to kill Norman. Not even two weeks later, not only was Josephine arrested for the murder of Norman, but Robert as well. But later the charges were dropped because for some odd reason, the witnesses that were so cooperative before no longer wanted to work with the police and some witnesses could not be found. So there was not enough evidence to convict Josephine Gray and Robert. So the charges were dropped and they were free to go. So the prosecution could not form a case due to lack of evidence, lack of witnesses. They do feel that there was a form of witness intimidation that played a part because even Norman's family did not want to speak. Reason being, they already thought Norman was under a spell in the first place, acting different, being controlled. So they felt if they were to speak up against Josephine Gray, that she would have vengeance out for them as well. So Norman is no longer with us. And with that, his insurance policy was paid out to his wife, Josephine gray in the amount of fifteen thousand dollars now mind you in today's time that may not be that much but we're talking about back in the day so this worth like five times the amount 
but it was paid out to his lovely wife, Josephine Gray, which she used to buy a new house with her fiance, Robert. Uh oh, my light just went out. Ooh. November 1975, less than two years after Norman's death, Robert and Josephine got married and even had a child together. And again, just like the marriage prior, the family would describe this marriage as toxic and unhealthy. But they continued with their marriage, and in the meantime, Josephine Gray had a second cousin who was having some trouble in New York. He was a teenager, I guess, the adolescent type of years. But. So the family asked Josephine Gray, could she take them in so he could just get a new perspective, new life, some discipline. So Josephine Gray agreed, like, don't worry, I got Cuzzo. He's going to be OK. We're going to take him in, take care of him. And then later on, Josephine Gray started an affair with her cousin, Clarence Good. Just to make that clear, the second cousin moved in with Josephine Gray and her husband, Robert. And Josephine Gray started an affair with her second cousin, Clarence Good. What in the Alabama? But it doesn't stop there. 1990. For some odd reason, Josephine Gray was chasing her husband, Robert, around the house with a gun. He was running for his life that he had to jump out of their second floor window and ran all the way down to his parents' house to get away from Josephine. But Josephine wasn't worried about Robert. She knew she had that under control. So she continued her affair with her cousin and even started a new affair with a co-worker. And we're not even halfway done with the story, y'all. So meanwhile, Robert is finally free, so he thinks. So he's telling his family like look I don't know what's going on Josephine has assaulted me multiple times she even came to my job and attacked me with a baseball bat and a knife so he used his freedom to press charges against her so the hearing was scheduled for October 5th but got pushed back to November 16th so with the hearing being scheduled for November 16th Josephine Gray had some time one day Josephine Gray was driving and she was following behind Robert she got so close up to him that she was able to line up with the side of his car Clarence who was in the car as well pointed a gun towards Robert in his car in the middle of the road and again Robert was able to escape because he quickly put his car in reverse to dodge the bullets so Robert already knew the drill he was like look this lady is trying to kill me he reported this incident to the police and he called his insurance to make sure that he changed the beneficiary so Josephine Gray if she did get her hands on him would not benefit from his death so in the meantime Robert's thinking he has everything under control he reported the incidents to the officers they're going to handle it for the trial he's now with his family back with his wife and his kids they're all so happy they see his natural personality coming back they're like we got our dad back the spell is broken they're celebrating but less than a week later and a week before the hearing is scheduled, November 9th, 1990, Robert was getting off work where he is a service manager at an elementary school. He went home, went to his apartment, but little did he know that someone was already there waiting on him. Two shots were fired, hitting Robert in his neck and chest, and his body was later found by his father. It was a while since the father heard from his son, so he went to check on him where he found Robert's dead body in his apartment. And for this detail, I'm not sure what it lines up with, but next to his body, there was a business car of a police detective who's been asking for help. That car was found by his body. I'm not sure. I haven't connected the dots on that yet. So Robert is no longer with us, but we first have to go back to Norman. Who killed Norman? So over the span of a six month investigation, Josephine and Clarence were charged with the murder of Norman due to one of the leads, which happens to be one of Norman's kids who says, listen, I think Josephine Gray has something to do with it. I heard her talking about it and she was even talking about killing their stepfather. And there were even statements made by Josephine's brother and daughter that all brought to the conclusion that Josephine Gray is behind these murders. So Josephine was arrested, but she was later released on bail. And this part made the investigation, the hearing, the trial a little murky because while Josephine was behind bars, her brother and daughter were like, yep, she did it. We know she did it. But as soon as Josephine was released, they all of a sudden recanted their statements. So this is the second time where witnesses are literally scared of Josephine. So they're trying to figure out why is everyone scared of this woman? Why one minute we have a witness, but the next minute we don't. So they literally asked her, do you practice witchcraft? 
do you practice voodoo like what's going on and this is what josephine had to say and i quote i do not practice no voodoo i do not practice no witchcraft just because i go and buy a lucky charm to play the lottery or something to buy herbs and drink herb tea or take olive oil and anoint myself that's in the bible and with this investigation the prosecutors were kind of like yeah that's cute because they still had a trial or trying to get a trial with nothing but scared witnesses so let's take a break right here and try to put some of these pieces together so by now you probably figured out that josephine gray is using some type of magic or ritual we'll call it to intimidate these witnesses to get away with a murder multiple times for financial gain which she is getting from the insurance policies so from my observation from my reading it seems that she's probably using some type of court system candle that's usually in botanica some type of confusion oil some shut up spells some forgetful rituals basically using anything possible for the witnesses to be scared that which comes naturally because they know she practiced some type of voodoo they call it voodoo so i'm going to refer to it as voodoo i know that sometimes the word voodoo gets used too loosely that it's literally could be hoodoo root work but they just all put it under voodoo so we're going to call it voodoo for the sake of this story but people were scared of her because they know that she practices voodoo but behind the scenes i know it's some dolls going on it's some confusion oils going on some shut up spells going on some stray away spells under my command spells for the lovers she probably got a whole altar just filled with different stuff for different different people so with this everyone had to get a little bit creative so september 4th 1991 a judge decided to add in a different type of evidence to the trial and this evidence was a phone call between josephine gray and a voodoo doctor by the name of rosie sims rosie sims went to the police and notified them that she had a conversation with josephine gray where she asked her could she kill her husband so this is the second person or the third because it was two witnesses before that literally say, yo, she came up to us and asked us, could we do it for her? I'm not sure if she was just trying to avoid getting blood on her hands or someone else could take the fall for it. So it would be easy for her to manipulate the system. But all of a sudden, when it's time for Rosie Sims to testify against Josephine Gray, she all of a sudden could not be found. Rosie Sims was on probation herself, but that had nothing to do with this trial that was going on. But she could not be found when it was time to testify against Josephine Gray. So October 1st, 1991, the charges that were against Josephine Gray for the murder of her husband, Robert, were dropped. But we still had to figure out what happened to Norman, who murdered Norman. Now, remember, Norman was murdered in 1974. We are now in 1991. Specifically, November 19th, 1991, where the charges against Josephine for the death of Norman was dropped as well guess just take a while guess why it was dropped due to a key witness refusing to testify so now remember before robert died he kind of already figured out what was going on so he changed his beneficiary and his insurance policy i guess it was something in the fine print that still made josephine gray entitled to his money he received a payout of over fifty thousand dollars from Robert's insurance policy, which she used to pay off the home that she purchased with Norman's insurance policy. So now Josephine and Clarence continue on with their life. But as the pattern continues, Clarence found himself depressed and isolated. He didn't have any type of access to the home. He wasn't allowed to have a house key. He wasn't allowed to have a car key. So in 1996, Josephine Gray threatened Clarence with the knife, the random attacks. I would like to know what leads up to these attacks or does she randomly like after breakfast be like, all right, I'm about to kill you. But Clarence was able to get away. He even moved in with a separate relative that was in Baltimore as well. And Clarence began to get a little bit of independence. He got a job working for a Loomis Loom, the armed car where they go pick up money from like different businesses. He got a job with them. So with him getting his independence one thing that was not independent from josephine was his insurance policy so his insurance policy lapsed with no premiums being paid so the insurance policy will only be active for another 60 days so june 21st 1996 baltimore police found clarence good in the back of his car with bullet wounds in his chest and back 
And for some odd reason, cocaine planted on him. In the documentary, they said that they feel that Josephine put cocaine on him to make it look like it was like a drug dealer type of interaction. But one lady in the documentary said, in Baltimore, ain't nobody about to leave drugs on you. If they're going to kill you, they're going to take them drugs. Now, prior to his death, Clarence told his sister Veronica how he was feeling a little off. He was starting to fear for his life and he started to begin to get a little paranoid. He was going to visit Josephine. Maybe he thought that would clear it up or get back on her good side, but it was too late. So of course, investigators at this point are like, look, we know it's her. We just have to find legitimate evidence that it is her. So they searched her home. They found nine millimeter bullets, which is the same that matches the gun that Clarence was shot with. They found blood stains in the garage, which had a vacuum that had blood in it that matched that same blood. But it still, for some odd reason, was not enough evidence to charge Josephine Gray with the murder of Clarence. So, of course, just in time before the insurance policy runs out, Josephine Gray received a payout of over a hundred thousand dollars from Clarence insurance policy. So prosecutors were getting frustrated. They knew they seen a pattern going on. They just had to have a different approach with catching her. But in the meantime, Josephine Gray was living her best life, moving on to her next victim, Andre. So Andre had no clue what happened to the other men before him. So he was going in naive, but Josephine Gray ran the same game on him, not giving him a key, being controlling, not letting him have access to anything. Neighbors even reported seeing Andre being locked out of the house because he was not allowed to have access to anything that belonged to Josephine. So investigators are like, okay, so she's dating this guy named Andre. Let's have a little talk with him. So they approached him like, hey, we need your help with something. We hear you dating Josephine. Let us tell you what's going on. So I'm not sure what plan they came up with. But November 7, 2001, a federal grand jury indicted Josephine Gray with eight counts of mail and wire fraud from collecting the money from the insurance policies and had intentionally caused the death to reap the benefits. The policies were covered by a Slayer's Rule which prevents any person in Maryland who intentionally kills the insurer to receive the benefits. And under this, it did not require Josephine to be found guilty to gain the conviction. The prosecutors only had to prove that she played a role in the death. And due to her history of threatening witnesses, they kind of already knew the drill not to let her out. So she was arrested without bail at Prince George's County Detention Center. But that didn't stop her. While in jail, she called Andre and said, listen, you better plead the fifth and not testify against me. So July 2002, the trial begins and Josephine Gray pleads not guilty to all charges. So just reminding you, the first murder took place in 1974 and she's just now getting on trial with substantial evidence of actually having a case in 2002. The prosecutors referred to Josephine Gray as a master manipulator who used each lover to kill their predecessor. Joe Mudano, one of the police detectives in Montgomery, shared that they got a court order to bug Josephine Gray's house. So they went in there with the recorders. They placed one in the bedroom and one in the kitchen. They tried to pinpoint where most of the conversation would take place, but they had to be careful because with this type of evidence that they were collecting, they only could record when she was referring to one of the victims in this specific case, Robert. So they all just have to sit there and be like, doo, 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 doo. But as soon as they hear Robert, they have to press record. And they did get some information out of this. So one of the recordings includes an incantation of a voodoo ritual they say that was going on where they hear Josephine Gray and one of her daughters Regina putting spells on Clarence of course some of the witnesses and Joe Modano one of the police investigators even heard his name in this ritual where they were putting spells on the investigators as well at first that would kind of creep me out but Joe says he doesn't really believe in it so he just kind of just brushed it off but he actually heard what they were suspecting this entire time taking place and with this it was other voodoo ritualistic materials that was found in Josephine's home as well so we did have a witness that was brave enough to testify against Josephine one was being Wilma I know you have not heard her throughout this story she is one of Josephine's Gray's 
few if not only female friends it stated that she didn't like too many women around her it was good that they had someone like Wilma who was willing to testify against Josephine because they met at the beach on vacation all that good stuff so while you know ha, 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 girl yes girl mm -hmm, during all of that I guess Josephine felt comfortable enough to share a newsletter that was going over Josephine's like cases murders all that was going on the investigation summarizing everything and being like kind of bragging about it like look what i did uh-huh girl they didn't catch me yeah i did the murders but guess what they tried to do this this and that and they could not get me she was bragging on it to her friend wilma and wilma's kind of like girl we was just having fun at the beach how i get in it because i would get frustrated too like you did not just admit murder to me why would you put me in this so wilma of course reported this to the police and then from there during the trial she testified and they say that you could see her emotion and frustration and shock while she was testifying and just restating everything that josephine said about what she did and with that emotion frustration that's exactly what they were looking for so they found it easy to believe her and put the pieces together as to what actually was going on with Josephine how she was getting away with all of this so one of the surviving men Andre testified as well and they described him more as a visual representation of what was going on a man that was being controlled scared for his life not having any freedom and just under the spells of Wilma so they actually got to see someone in person who was about to be her next victim. But of course, Josephine's Gray's defense had something to say too. So they pulled the whole, how could this mother of six, grandmother to 11, victim of losing the love of her life three times, the victim of rumors and gossip, how could she do this? She's not the threat, she is a victim in all of this. She received those insurance policies because she was entitled to them. She took care of those men and now she's gonna use that money to create a better life for her and her children and her grandchildren after a three-week trial josephine was found guilty on all counts and was given the maximum sentence for her crimes which was 40 years in prison she showed no emotion when this sentence was read but she did make a statement via her public defender saying the following she gives her faith in god as a higher power who knows she has committed no offense or done anything wrong she tried to file for an appeal in 2005 but of course that was denied she is currently being held in federal medical center in fort worth texas and her earliest release date is february 26th 2037 and on the date and year of her release she will be 91 years old so many people fear that she could come back for vengeance because there is a decent possibility that she will make it out alive because she's still alive to this day all right you guys and that is the story of josephine gray the voodoo witch killer my camera is starting to act up so let me wrap up this video throughout this process i feel that josephine gray was using some heavy ritualistic work and i feel that each husband that passed was actually a sacrifice to make the next ritual even stronger along with her being able to benefit monetarily from their insurance policies I, she probably was using some of that money to give offerings to different spirits as well of course she was more tapping into the bad spirits in order to get away with this but she used her magic her skill her knowledge to manipulate the system of course this is possible to do but not recommended because karma gone karma no matter what and if you do bad into the world bad will have to come back so i know a lot of people think that people who do bad work get away with it longer but trust me in the end they will face their consequences so this all led up to joe Josephine being able to get away with it for so long but in the end they were able to go do a little alley hoop and catch her for insurance fraud I guess she wasn't putting that in the voodoo dolls or the rituals are on the candles to cover all areas but they were able to get her in the end but thank you guys so much for tuning into this video and like I always say as above so below as within so without as the universe of the soul until next time guys I'll see you. Thank you.